I-20N is the baby in the range, so not quite as quick out there on the track, but hey, 10 grand-ish cheaper by the time you get it on the road. The other thing about it is that it's less of a computer game, right, like the other two, and more of a pure mechanical driving experience. So let's get out there on the track and see if we can't break it. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Yes, <laughs> for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the card that may or may not be up there now, dude. I can't tell if it's all that obvious from what you've seen so far, but as we drive here at the track, Cyclone Tiffany is blowing over the ridge towards us at 100 miles an hour. And she's about to soak, some would say gush all over, our nice dry racetrack. Say la vie, dude. She's nothing if not consistent. 20 laps later. Any fucking wetter? Oh look, there's Noah. I wonder what he's building. I-20N might be the runt of the litter in the end stable, but every inch of this vehicle, inside and out, is tailored to performance. The infotainment display even includes GPS track mapping and an inbuilt lap timer. And I think the only Australian track that's not built in is Phillip Island. Maybe because they're being cocks about it. As if you can own the IP of your racetrack's geographic coordinates. Like, come on, in the scheme of deranged concepts, that's up there with most political thought bubbles. Anyway, the relationship between a regular hairdresser's i20, which you cannot buy here in Australia anyway, and this car is kind of like the relationship between humans and chimps. There's some DNA overlap, obviously, but only one of us has invented online porn, right? This thing is a proper ground-up, factory-integrated, out-of-the-box track special. I tried to break it and or kill it over 20 laps at Wakefield Park outside Goulburn and I failed. It got faster every lap as I walked it up to the edge. Basically you just brake later and later and carry more and more speed into the turn subject to not overcooking it and missing the apex. And I have to say the limiting factor here was clearly me. The brakes proved unkillable, the tyres did not go off, the sump remained full of oil. These are the three things that typically kill performance cars on a racetrack if they're not really beefed up for that kind of driving. And I'd suggest you'd have to be a very high level driver indeed to be able to exploit the maximum performance potential of this car at every point on a moderately fast track like Wakefield. Like, Wakefield's not Eastern Creek, okay, where you're tipping the car into turn one at 200 k's an hour plus downhill, but it's plenty fast enough to kill the brakes, in particular, of most road cars, including many road cars that purport to be properly hot, but really aren't track ready. I-20N is not that fast in a straight line. Like, if you buy it and you expect that, you've already kind of missed the point. The I-30N and the Kona N are fast in a straight line. The modest improvement in peak power recently trumpeted by Hyundai 4 i30N is actually eclipsed by the rev range wide pump up of the power curve and that really is impressive. i20N, by comparison, is more about the accessibility of the overall track-ready integration and chuckability, attributes for which you have to give it at least 13 points out of a possible 10. Compared with the i30N and the Kona N, and let's face it, Kona N could have emerged recently from a lab in Wuhan, the i20N is a lot more of an 
analog style of car. It's got a six speed manual only, no dual clutch transmission. It's old school in terms of its engineering fundamentals. But you've got to love the rev matching, even though it renders obsolete all the endless hours which you might have spent perfecting the heel and toe downshift. Computerized rev matching is just better than you, dude. And for me, this was quite a bitter pill to swallow, but you've got to respect the facts. Otherwise, you'd be the prime minister, and nobody wants that. Hyundai's NCAR rev matching is certainly better than me in every conceivable downshift scenario, but I suppose you can turn it off if you want. In fact, the whole N custom mode is brilliant for that. It gives you the opportunity to dial in steering and suspension settings and things of this nature to suit your own personal preferences. There's a lot of tech on top of this car's old school hot hatch fundamentals. One salient difference though is that the i30N and the Kona Wuhan has an electronic limited slip front diff, whereas the i20N's limited slip diff up the pointy end is mechanical. And that means it's kind of reactive, whereas the i30N can, in a sense, look ahead and preemptively engage. That e-diff in Big Brother is incredible, frankly. I'm not suggesting this one is crap, but you do get the performance you pay for. Inevitably, too soon for this particular track drive today, Cyclone Tiffany and the track became as one. And the heavens opened and it just frigging bucketed down endlessly. So I buttoned off and just projectile vomited my 20 lap first impressions into the nearest camera, which we'll get to in just a sec. And then we'll jump over to the fat cave and I'll try to figure out if the i20N is right for you or wrong for you. But first, this. This report is sponsored by Olight. Olight's contribution to the channel, of course, helps make reports like this one on the i20N possible. The January sale kicks off tonight, Monday the 17th of January at 8pm. It runs until midnight tomorrow, Tuesday the 19th of January. There's big discounts basically across the range. There's a link in the description plus a code for 12% off on any non-sale item right now or any torch, you know, down the track if you miss the sale. Today what I want to do though is demystify the core range of Olight tactical torches because choice does not set you free. It's really a burden. Like try buying a car. You want to buy a Corolla sized car, okay? Let's say. There's 30 Corolla sized cars in the market, roughly, and who's got time even to make a list with them all on it, let alone drill down into the comparative strengths and weaknesses and then figure out which one's right for you, okay? And this choice burden is everywhere in the consumer world. Like, I bought a pair of safety boots yesterday. I'm at the shop and a wall of like 400 different safety boots are staring back at me. They're all purporting to be the best of friggin' course. I just need like safetybootexpert.com.au to jump in and go, it's that one or that one, dude, because you don't want this 246 block falling on your foot. Anywho. This is the core Olight tactical torch range, and I define a tactical torch not by this sort of crenellated bezel at the front, which has dubious utility in my view, but by this clever tail switch on the back, which has typically two settings, bright and Jesus, that's bright, okay? And the reason that's got a tactical application is because anytime you're under stress, You've got this inevitable rush of stress hormones, cortisol, noradrenaline, things of that nature. And one of the features of being in that state is fine motor control tends to be lost and it gets very difficult to rotate a torch around and find a switch on the barrel and turn it on like that carefully. You can always find the back of a torch because if you're grabbing it like that, your thumb's always there, it's on, you're ready to go. Okay, so that's quite useful. So, start with the baby. 
This is the Warrior Mini 2, okay? And I carry this torch every day. And it's getting a little bit nicked up from where it keeps knocking against the Leatherman that's also in my pocket. And it's so useful all the time. At night, taking out the bins, finding something that you just dropped under the bench here in the fat cave. Like, it's got a million uses, okay? And I really like this style of torch because tactical switch on the back, bright and Jesus. And then little tail, little barrel switch here for numerous other brightness modes. So you can get this out and it can be camping or just in the middle of the night somewhere. You can have a look around in the bottom of your bag without supernova destroying your night vision. That's good. If you wanted to take one step up from that though and still be in the domain of sort of everyday carry, you could go for the M2R Pro Warrior. Okay, and it's still got the tactical switch on the back and it's got the barrel switch here for varying degrees of brightness when you're not under pressure and you know it's got a pocket clip as well and it's pocket size more or less although it does take up you know substantially more pocket real estate but you could still justify this for everyday carry if you use the torch a hell of a lot and these kind of more robust features greater brightness whatever if that mattered to you. When you take the next step up, you're really entering sort of less versatile torch domain, much more tactical. And to me, this is the Warrior X3. And what happens there is you lose the switch on the barrel, but you get more robustness. You get these zirconium beads on the center, which are good for getting through a uh, tempered glass, like safety glass window in a car, you know, for kids trapped in a car in the middle of summer and every second counts like they say in all the safety documentation then you can get through a window pretty easily with a torch like this it's super bright super robust it comes with this silicon ring as an option which aids in grip retention because it sits between your fingers so the only thing that uh, well there's two things about this torch that would give me pause uh, to purchase it as a one-off and that is it's a little bit bulky for everyday carry in your pocket. Quite fine for the car though, and the glass rescue option is also a factor. You can recharge it in the car via USB. In fact, all of these torches have a universal charging system on the back. You get a charging cable with them. It just magnets on. Olight's whole thing is magnets, right? <laughs> magnets. So it magnets on on this end. It's got USB on the other end. It charges up. It's great, okay? I guess this kind of torch is ideal if you do a job where you're sort of paramilitary or military, you do security, maybe you're a law enforcement officer, you've got molly webbing or some other sort of tactical vest and you've got a pouch. Because if you've got a pouch, this style of torch is ideal for that. So would this one be though, and it would weigh slightly less and hey, if you've ever got to run with all that crap, I guess every gram counts, right? So anyway, they're kind of the tactical options in the domain of more or less everyday carry. And at a pinch, you could jam this into a pocket. It's just not the kind of thing you'd want to wear in a pocket every day, okay? When you step up to the next level though, we're really talking about searchlight kind of domain. These next two torches are really good at grabbing a tightly focused beam and throwing it hundreds of meters down the track. There's no uh, barrel switch on this one, which is the Warrior X Turbo, but you do get a sort of diffuse cone around the central point of long range brightness if that makes sense. You get a pocket clip as well, although I really think this one is much more at home in your four-wheel drive or in a pouch. And if long-range search is your thing, then this is a great option. The Javelot Pro 2 is even better for that though, and it comes with a little tail switch on the barrel. So you can kind of dial this in, and it also tells you the remaining battery level, which can be quite helpful. All right, so this is the same kind of deal when it comes to long range core beam with a cone around the outside for other sort of more close up torch duties, but you can't turn the bright central beam off in either of these. If you're a boaty or you do a lot of search, if you, I don't know, maybe you've got some sort of aircraft or you spend a lot of time in a helicopter, whatever, you need to see what's on the ground or what's on the shore, then the Javelot Pro 2 is a dead set, really useful option for that. But obviously it's not as convenient to carry 
at all. Okay, it takes up a lot of real estate. I just wanted to lay that out for you because often when you're shopping online, you know, you don't get all that much of a sense of scale. And I hope this has given you that in terms of the perspective and which one might be right for you. For me, it's the Warrior Mini 2 every day because you frankly don't know it's in your pocket. I've sometimes forgotten and done a whole workout in the gym, whatever, without taking it out of my pocket. So that's got to tell you something. If you can forget it's there, that's got to be good, particularly if something is that useful. Anyway, sale tonight from 8 p.m. All the details in the description, code for the discount. Thank you very much for watching. Now, back to me in the i20N. Let's figure out if that vehicle is right or not for you. It is impossible to have a crack in an i20N on a track and not fall in love with its overall chuckability, right? As you can probably see, the heavens have opened and I'm just gonna take this opportunity to button off and talk to you a little bit about what it's like to drive this car the way Albert Beerman intended, right? Which is like, it's not really about being fast, it's really about having fun. And those two things go together, like on a racetrack, it's kind of impossible to have fun if you're not also going fast and exploiting the limits of performance. But there is a balance there, right? You want the car to step out a little bit and you want to overcook it a little bit from time to time. And you don't want it to be a life and death experience, right? And some cars are like that, like some big fat Porsche, for example, if you're on a racetrack in a car like that with heaps of mumbo and very little communication between in control and out of control, frankly, then there are consequences if you get it right. And it's not as much fun. And I also want to talk to you about the definition of fun, right? Because people get that wrong. I don't think fun is that zany, kooky, loopy, giggling thing, right? It's doing something where there are consequences and getting on top of it and being happy with how you did it, okay? And to me, that's what driving a performance car on a racetrack is all about. I'm sort of old enough and ugly enough to know that I'm never gonna be a race driver. I just don't have that software, right? But I can have a shitload of fun in a car like an i20N because I can walk it up to its limit from time to time and it'll tell me that we're there and I step over the line occasionally and have to sort that out and it won't kill me. It'll just be a supremely satisfying experience to get that all together on the track in the moment, right? And to me, that's what a car like this is all about. And the other thing is you can drive its tits off without killing it. Like you can have a red hot go and the tires are gonna warm up and the brakes are gonna work but you're not gonna run out of brakes off the end of the main straight, which is frankly terrifying. And I've had fun and that's not it, right? So these kinds of things do not happen in well-sorted performance cars like this. You just drive to the track, pump up the tires, have a red hot go, and then turn N custom mode off and drive home. And it really is that simple. The only thing to bear in mind is that obviously when you drive in this way, normal wear and tear accelerates. So if you do a lot of track driving and things of that nature, change the oil more often, dude. Check the tires more often. You're gonna to need to replace them more often. But aside from that, it's not gonna be lunched engines and broken gearboxes and burnt rotors and all of this dogs and friggin' cats living together in cars with mumbo that just really aren't that well sorted out. So this is a case of, I, I don't know, buy once, cry once, you know, spend the whatever it is, high 30s or something, get your i20 in on the road, don't modify it, doesn't need that, and then just have fun in it, dude, and keep it the way the factory built it, and it'll just perform for you in this context for years to come. I wanted to give you that completely unscripted. The first impression after 20, I dare you to break me hot laps. But buying a car, any car, right? It's kind of a big call. And once you buy it, you are more or less locked in for 
quite some time. So the core question in play here is, is an i20N right for you? And as I see it, that kind of depends on you because there's nothing intrinsically wrong with the i20N. I guess if you're a badge snob, you might also be looking at Polo GTI, which is heavier and slower and DCT only, and more or less guaranteed to fall apart if you manage to have a red hot go on a racetrack with it. It's just not designed for that, in my view. You'll kill the brakes in short order or lunch, something else that's kind of important to the process, and it's going to be ugly, dude. This is not necessarily a bad thing or a terrible criticism of the Polo GTI. It's just that it's not really designed for that kind of use, right? Unless you try and make it do that, of course, and you expect it to hold up. That might end in tears. If you do harbour any track day fantasies, I'd suggest that the Polo GTI will be something of a square peg in a round hole, ultimately. The obvious direct competitor here is the Ford Fiesta ST. And okay, it's a three-cylinder turbo 1.5 versus i20N's 1.6-litre turbo 4, which is far more conventional in a hot hatch. The Ford demands 95 Ron premium unleaded, whereas the Hyundai is going to run on Cat's Piss 91. But I suppose if you're a performance pervert, like, congratulations, dude, me too, we'd all probably feed them both 98 anyway, right? These two cars are as direct as competitors get in the real world. Essentially, my reluctance to own the Ford is twofold. A, Ford has a poor track record, frankly, with the reliability of its products generally, but performance cars in particular. Like, look at the Focus RS. Overhyped tremendously at the beginning when it was launched. They took an engine off the rack. They wound it right up. They didn't do the R&D properly. And there was a global pandemic of blown head gaskets because the block has a floating deck, meaning the cylinders are unsupported at the top. So they spalled the shit out of the head gaskets because they moved under extreme pressure and the head gaskets failed. You can certainly fix a head gasket, but it's much more difficult to fix an engineering culture in a major corporation where near enough is good enough. And B, this goes for Volkswagen as well, frankly, Ford and Volkswagen have a track record as long as your friggin' arm of throwing customers under the bus whenever they think they can get away with it, no matter how legitimate the customer's problem. Hyundai seems pretty serious about customer support and also getting the end division right. And I get the impression they really don't want to shoot their reputation in the dick by undercooking the R&D. The i30N has been deployed quite reliably now for many years and there's no evidence to suggest the i20N ownership experience is going to be any different. And they do look after their customers. So as long as it's not a full-on race like a competitive motorsport event, the warranty on i20N is fully compatible with as many track days as you can jam into yo friggin' calendar. Just bear in mind, dude, that warranty doesn't cover wear and tear and wear rates are going to be pretty high when you drive like that. However, I would not buy an i20N if, for you, The purchase is just about the look, right? It is pretty distinctive, but there's more to it than that. Performance cars are a bit rough and sort of edgy to drive on the road, and it might be novel for the first few weeks, but it could get old, depending on you. They're not the sharpest tool in the shed for the daily commute, in other words, sort of kind of thing. Or actually, they're too sharp for that everywhere, except on a racetrack. The i20N is not horrible to drive normally. Like, it does get a lot tamer and more compliant when you switch from N mode to normal mode, but it's still intrinsically a pretty edgy car, and you're going to feel the bumps, and you'll be slowing down for all the speed humps, etc. I'd suggest that this car is ideal for you if you really want to get into track driving without spending endless days or weeks or even months underneath your car, bolting on hot bits at 
considerable expense and kind of hoping for the best. It's always a bit of a lottery with the R&D doing a card that way and ultimately it could be quite an expensive game or at least it could go on forever, couldn't it? All of this hard work has already been done for you with the i20N with considerable engineering attention to detail by dudes who really know what the F you CK they are doing and with the resources to prove it and get it right. And look, dude, I'm not shit canning you if you want to make like Marty and Blair from Mighty Car Mods. Those blokes are legends, right? And building your own track weapon can be F-U-N in the driveway at home indeed. Go for it, dude, like free country. Except, of course, Victoria. I'm just saying, if it's more about the performance driving for you than it is about building the bespoke track performance car, here's an out-of-the-box solution that's really well supported and, frankly, brilliantly executed. And if you start this process with average driving skills, you can progress to the point where you are easily within the top 1% of all drivers using just this one car. If you can be on top of an i20N everywhere on a racetrack, you are a pretty capable driver, dude. And it is fun, like grown-up fun, being on top. <laughs> I you'd agree. I get it if you want to spend your downtime fitting new diff centres and lowered springs and beefy brakes and aftermarket turbos with humongous intercoolers. <laughs> and sorting out all of the sort of niggly R&D integration to make it all work properly together. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, have fun. Just, this is not the base car to start a project such as that from, okay? You'll probably just make it worse at considerable expense. Now, would I change anything with the i20N, or is it perfect? Let's go live right now to earlier me in Goulburn. Just about to explain to Noah that it's physically impossible to build a wooden boat big enough to hold two of every animal, irrespective of the plans which he recently downloaded from God. I was going to say there's nothing I would change about i20N, but you know there is. I'm always playing fantasy car. I want this bit of that car and that bit of this car and this bit of that car and let's put it all together and build the perfect car. Okay, but of course this is a pipe dream, it can't happen, perfect car's never going to exist. But if I possibly could, if Harry Potter's friggin' wand, if I had one shot <laughs> and I could only fire it at i20N, I'd get the E-diff out of the i30N and the Kona N and I'd be jamming it so hard and so fast into the pointy end of this thing and I reckon that would just be Jedi. It'd be Jedi.